It's a foggy night. A young Coast Guard recruit, John Cullen, patrols the beach near Amagansett, Long Island. To amuse himself during this chilly walk, Cullen sings the latest hits, including I've Got a Girl in Kalamazoo. His singing comes to an abrupt halt when he spots three men holding a small boat in the surf. Cullen is actually running about 10 minutes behind schedule on his midnight patrol. Ironically, because of his tardiness, he stumbles onto Operation Pistorius, a Nazi sabotage plot to wreak havoc in America. In the spring of 1942, Germany was riding a wave of success. Several concentration camps were fully operational, and the Third Reich had won huge battles in several countries. However, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US had entered the war. Hitler worried about America's industrial power. The only way the Axis was going to win was to obstruct America's ability to make war. Therefore, a sabotage program, Operation Pistorius, was created, named in honor of Franz Daniel Pistorius, leader of the first German migrants to arrive in the New World. On April 13th, the nine military intelligence recruits selected for Operation Pistorius convened at the farm on the shore of Lake Quenz in Germany. They were split into two missions. George John Dash was leader of the first. On his team was Ernst Peter Berger, Joseph Schmidt, Richard Kirin, and Heinrich Heink. The leader of the second group was Edward Curling. On his team were Herbie Hopf, Hermann Neubauer, and Werner Thiel. All the men had previously spent time in the US, a few were US citizens. Most had come to Germany compelled to fight for the fatherland. They all spoke varying degrees of English. Over about five weeks of intense training, the saboteurs learned several skills including how to pick locks, build incendiary devices, and plant bombs. They created new identities and were provided with false documents. During downtime, they read old copies of American newspapers and magazines, long since banned in Germany, to brush up on American culture, such as the New York Times and the Saturday Evening Post. As their training progressed, the agents were sent to Berlin. Here they spent several days taking field trips around the city to see canals, railway systems, and industrial factories. It was a chance to view up close the types of mechanisms they were going to destroy. Dash's team would focus on sabotaging hydroelectric plants and industrial factories. If the saboteurs could severely disrupt aluminum production, they might be able to prevent the United States from creating an effective air force to fight the Luftwaffe. Kerling's team would target transportation systems, destroying crucial railroad passes and critical bottlenecks, such as the Hellgate Bridge, which connected Long Island to the Bronx. If there were materials left over from attacking major targets, the saboteurs would focus on targets of opportunity, such as planting small explosive devices in Jewish-owned department stores. The point of the small attacks would be to spread panic rather than kill. As final preparations were made, each saboteur was handed three documents to sign. The first was a financial contract, stipulating salary and how much of his family would receive in the event of his death. The second document committed the Abwehr, or the German Military Intelligence Service, to find appropriate civilian jobs for the saboteurs once the war was over. The third document was a pledge of secrecy. The saboteurs were to never talk about their work to outsiders on penalty of death. The saboteurs had a stopover in Paris, where they were given money and told to go out and have a good time. They ran wild, Heinck especially. He got drunk at a bar and announced that he was a secret agent. After three days in Paris, the group went to the coastal town of Lorient to meet the U-boats that would take them to the US. Dash and Kerling, the two group leaders, were given $50,000 for operational purposes and $5,000 for each agent. In addition, each saboteur was given a specially designed money belt containing $4,000 plus $450 in ready cash for immediate use. Ultimately, the saboteurs would take over $180,000 with them to the United States, equivalent of $2 million in today's dollars. However, while counting the money, Haupt noticed some of the bills he'd been given weren't greenbacks but so-called yellowbacks, gold certificates withdrawn from circulation in 1934, after the United States went off the gold standard. The men were furious. Such carelessness could have caused them to be quickly caught. They searched all the money, removing the incriminating bills. The saboteur's confidence in the mission was shaken. Then Dash accidentally left his identification papers on a train, along with a few pictures of his wife and mother, as well as a notebook that contained jottings from sabotage lessons. Schmidt came down with an STD and had to quit the mission so he could receive treatment. Later, he would admit that he had injected his genitals with a solution to mimic symptoms to get out of going on the sabotage mission. Finally, on May 28th, Dash's group departed from the Lorient Harbor on the U-202. The plan was to drop them off in the northeast. A few days later, Curling's team left on U-584 with plans to be dropped off in Florida. Along with each team went four special waterproof wooden crates containing detonators and explosives. On June 12th, U-202 arrived at Long Island. 
Dash's team and their equipment were rowed ashore. Due to the bad fog and strong surf, the sailors rowed in circles, almost capsizing the boat and drenching the saboteur's bags. Once on the beach, they quickly hauled the crates up to the sand dunes and hastily covered them with sand. Then they laid a raincoat on the sand and spread out their sodden clothing. While the rest of the team was dealing with the clothing, Dash helped the sailors try to launch the dinghy. That was when the Coast Guardsman Cullen stumbled across the scene. Dash tried to convince Cullen that they were lost fishermen run aground. As Cullen grew suspicious, Dash pulled out a wad of bills and forced them on Cullen, aggressively asking him if he would remember Dash's face if he saw it again. Cullen, who was unarmed, felt outnumbered and threatened. He took the money and backed away. Once he was out of sight in the fog, he ran to the Coast Guard station. Most of the Coast Guard were asleep and were disbelieving when Cullen woke them up shouting about the Germans. That is, until they saw the money. About 30 minutes after the incident, a Coast Guard team returned to where Cullen had met the man. They spread out and searched the beach, but the strangers were long gone. However, they could smell diesel fumes wafting in from the sea. Although the fog was still thick, they caught glimpses of a long boat stuck on a sandbar. U-202 had gotten stranded on a sandbar after getting close to the beach. Over several hours, the captain tried to make the boat as light as possible and maneuver it free. Around 3 a.m., the captain began to prep to scuttle the sub, but the tide started to rise. They gave it a final try and were able to float the U-boat. Though several Coast Guardsmen and naval radio men from the Amagansett Naval Radio Station saw and reported the sub, leaders further up the chain only logged the sightings and didn't investigate, allowing U-202 to escape back to the Atlantic. As they combed the beach, the Coast Guard found clothing, a wet sea bag, a pack of German cigarettes, and a freshly turned mound of sand. When they dug, they came across four wooden crates. Later, when the Coast Guard intelligence officers opened the crates, they found a variety of sabotage devices. They counted the wad of bills the mysterious stranger had slipped to Cullen. It was $260. Meanwhile, the saboteurs managed to trek undetected to the train station just outside of the village of Amagansett. They cleaned up as best they could, hiding wet swimming trunks and other clothes in bushes opposite the station. Once the station opened, they bought four one-way tickets for an express train bound for Jamaica, Queens. After the train left, the station master discovered the abandoned wet clothes and, thinking nothing of it, threw them in the incinerator. After arriving in New York City, agents split into pairs and went on shopping sprees to replace the clothes they'd left behind on the beach. Dash and Berger took rooms at the Governor Clinton Hotel in Manhattan, while Kieran and Haig took rooms at another hotel. The plan was to lie low for a bit. The team leaders would meet on July 4th in a hotel in Cincinnati to coordinate their sabotage operations. Coast Guard intelligence delivered everything they found on the beach to their New York headquarters. The chiefs decided to bring the FBI into the investigation. Senior naval officers were also notified. Dash had made a few cryptic statements to Berger during his training, trying to suss out how he felt. Now he put all his cards on the table and told Berger he wasn't going through with the mission. He hated Nazism and was going to report the plot to the FBI. As it turned out, Berger had similar feelings. Both of them had experienced harsh and unfair conditions in Germany and agreed to the mission as a way to get back to the US. However, they were afraid to go to the New York office of the FBI because they'd been told that it had been under constant observation by the Gestapo. On the other hand, they had to be careful not to be caught by US authorities before they could turn themselves in. In the end, they agreed to telephone the FBI in New York, provide a rough outline of their mission, and announce that one of them would travel to Washington to meet with J. Edgar Hoover on a very important matter. Unfortunately, the agent manning the phone desk at the New York FBI didn't take the call seriously. The call was simply logged, deemed crazy, and promptly forgotten no need to notify Washington. To calm his nerves, an anxious dash turned to gambling. He went to one of his old gambling clubs and went on a wild, high-stakes, 36-hour card-playing binge. Meanwhile, the saboteurs from U-584 had an easy landing in Florida at Ponte Verde Beach. They also were able to hide their sabotage gear and make their way undetected to Jacksonville. They also split into pairs, checked into hotels, and went shopping. In the evening over drinks, they agreed on a plan of action. Kerling and Thiel would travel to Cincinnati and New York, Neubauer had hopped to Chicago. They would meet again on July 6, two days after the planned July 4th rendezvous between Kerling and Dash in Cincinnati. For now, they would leave their explosives hidden. At some point, Kerling and Hopped would return to Florida and retrieve them. In New York, Kerling and Hank became suspicious when Dash skipped check-in meetings. Berger tried to smooth things over. Dash went to Washington. After some frustrating phone calls where he had passed from person to person, he was finally able to get a meeting with Dwayne L. Trainer, the head of the FBI's anti-sabotage unit. A skeptical trainer only took the meeting because of a strange story making the office rounds about German agents landing on Long Island. For the next several days, Dash dictated a statement that eventually grew to 254 single-space typewritten pages. Once Trainer realized that Dash could be telling the truth, he rushed regular summaries of what Dash was saying to J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. 
Hoover ordered Dash's hotel room searched. Agents found a briefcase full of money and other clues which seemed to confirm Dash's story. The FBI tracked Berger down and placed him under surveillance, figuring that he would lead him to the other saboteurs. They were right, and within a few days all three men were arrested. When interrogated, Berger was very cooperative and helpful. By June 24, the FBI had surveilled and arrested the Team 2 saboteurs also. Lastly, Dash was taken into custody. Trainer gently explained to Dash that his confession plan assumed that the US government was unaware of the landing at the Amagansett Beach. In fact, they had been investigating the case since then. Dash was just as criminal as the others. Worried that other agencies would claim jurisdiction over the matter, Hoover quickly held a press conference announcing the plot and arrest of the saboteurs. He emphasized the central role played by the FBI in cracking the case. There was no mention of Dash's confession, which actually cracked the case, or the role the Coast Guard had played. The press ate up the dramatic story. Shortly thereafter, American radio stations in Europe started carrying reports of Operation Pistorius' arrest. The details discussed revealed that the Americans had clearly uncovered the full plot and gotten the agents to confess, making the operation a catastrophic failure as well as giving the Americans a large propaganda victory. The Fuhrer was livid. He summoned the Abwehr chiefs and subjected them to tirades before ending sabotage programs for America. On July 2nd, President Roosevelt issued Executive Proclamation 2561 creating a military tribunal to prosecute the Germans. It was thought that a civilian court would go too easy on them and there were worries that lawyers for the saboteurs might invoke habeas corpus, a procedure that could send the case to the Supreme Court. Furthermore, President Roosevelt wanted to use the case to send a clear warning to Hitler to refrain from similar plots in the future. At this time, Director Hoover had kept from Roosevelt the assistance provided to the FBI by Dash and Berger. The president believed the saboteurs to be equally guilty. The Germans were quickly charged and tried for four offenses. 1. Violating the law of war. 2. Violating Article 81 of the Articles of War defining the offense of corresponding with or giving intelligence to the enemy. Number 3. Violating Article 82 of the Articles of War, defining the offense of spying. And number 4. Conspiracy to commit the offenses alleged in the first three charges. The trial was swift and all eight saboteurs were found guilty and sentenced to death. Because of their confessions, President Roosevelt commuted Dash's sentence to a 30-year prison term and Berger's to life. Dash became extremely bitter about his plight. He felt he was treated unfairly and shouldn't have to serve prison time at all. On Saturday, August 8th, the six saboteurs were executed by electric chair and quietly buried in a graveyard for unclaimed bodies in the District of Columbia. In April 1948, President Harry S. Truman pardoned Dash and Berger. They were deported to Germany. The country was wrestling with economic collapse and it was difficult to find employment. Also, many Germans regarded Dash and Berger as traitors. Both men struggled. Several months after he returned to Germany, Berger went to the US government office in Stuttgart and came face to face with Reinhold Barth one of his instructors at the Quince Lake Sabotage School. Barth had once worked for the Long Island Railroad before being repatriated to Germany to fight for the fatherland. Now he had parlayed his fluent English and background to get a job as a US Army liaison officer with the German railway system. A man who had given lessons in blowing up American railroads was making a good living at a job monitoring the movements of US troops and military supplies throughout the German transport system. Ironically, if Barth wanted to carry out acts of sabotage against the United States, he was now in the ideal position to do so. Berger tried to alert US authorities to Barth's dangerous background, but his words fell on deaf ears. Operation Pistorius was over. The FBI had long since given up on trying to track down the masterminds behind the plot. The powers that be were focused on reconstructing a new Germany. We know you want to watch another video. Several modern companies made a fortune collaborating with Nazis during World War II. Click here to find out more. The Nazis committed several war crimes including creating a house of horrors. Learn about the nightmarish house of shutters here.